Hey everyone, Riley here with Dark Arrow. We just finished drop testing the landing gear for the Dark Arrow 1 prototype. This was our most extensive test campaign to date, and we ended up dropping the airplane over 125 times. Now that we made it this far with testing, we wanted to show our test setup, the range of tests we conducted, and even some of the things that we broke. Let's get into it. I want to set the stage and first talk about why we do drop testing at all. We get a lot of questions and comments basically asking, why don't you just send it and fly the airplane? The big reason we don't do that is for safety. The Dark Air One is a new aircraft design and there's a lot we need to prove out before we fly. It's a lot safer to prove out as much as we can on the ground and identify any shortcomings in the design here rather than up in the air. We've already done pretty extensive testing on a lot of the structures in the aircraft, like when we proof load tested the wing or the tail or the control system, and the same principles apply to validating the landing gear. Even though a landing gear collapse might be more survivable than say a wing breaking off, it still wouldn't be a good idea to try to validate the landing gear through flight testing. Validating the landing gear on the ground through drop testing is just a lot more controlled. We can control the impact velocity, the pitch attitude on impact, as well as the aircraft weight, and we can do this repeatedly through multiple tests, and this is good for data collection. If something doesn't behave the way we expect it to, first thing we can do is review the test data to inform our decisions on how we're gonna change the design. We've highlighted the landing gear design in other videos, but I'll talk about it again here real quick. It's a trailing link suspension with an off-the-shelf air shock. The big appeal with trailing link suspension is that it makes it a little bit easier to achieve smooth landings without bouncing the aircraft compared to some other designs. With this off-the-shelf air shock, there's a lot that we can tweak to get good landing performance. We can change the pressure in the shock to give different spring rates. And we can also modify the internal valving to give different damping on rebound. Drop testing gives us a systematic way to dial in these shock variables and ultimately optimize its performance. One thing that's tricky with this drop testing is that we're using the aircraft itself as a test article. It'd be nice if we could separate the landing gear from the fuselage and test them independently. We were able to do that with the nose gear and we did that whole test campaign and made a video about it. I'll leave a link up above if you want to check that out. We couldn't do that with the main gear because the structures that support the main gear are part of the test. We need to validate those as well. There's a large piece of carbon fiber called the trunnion frame that the main gear are mounted to. That's bonded into the fuselage and it's integrated into the fuselage structures. They're married together, they can't really be separated. So we have to test that with the main landing gear. We want the airframe to remain airworthy after drop testing. So we really had to think through how we we're gonna approach testing and explore the limits of these structures without breaking them. I'll talk through that more in a minute. Let's talk about the test setup and the different types of landing scenarios we're trying to simulate. You can imagine there's a whole bunch of different ways that the airplane can impact the ground on landing. We're really most concerned about the most extreme landing scenarios and we can break them up into different categories or different types of hard landing impacts. And that's what we have here. There's three phases of testing that we did. I got three columns to organize that and we'll talk through them from left to right. The first phase of drop testing that we did is called a level landing with an inclined reaction load. That's simulating the airplane coming in basically level, impacting the ground as if you didn't flare, just flew it right into the runway. And when the airplane lands or touches down, you get impact forces. That's shown by these blue force vectors here. You also get drag loads on the airplane. That's shown by these red force vectors here, and that's from tire spin up as the wheels touch the ground. I've shown these originating from the center of the wheels. The reality is that they're actually from the contact point where the wheels touch the ground. It just works out a little bit better the way I'm trying to illustrate this if I draw those at the center of the wheels. Simulating these forces can be a little bit tricky. We were able to simulate both the tire spin up loads and the impact forces on the nose gear through a drop test fixture where we spun the tire and then literally drop the nose gear. That works fine if you just have one landing gear subassembly. That gets a little bit tricky spinning up all three tires uh, with the whole airframe. So there's other ways that we can test this or simulate this, and that's what our test setup looks like here. We can combine the drag force and the ground reaction impact force into uh, a combined reaction load or this inclined reaction load. That's the purple vector I'm showing here. We can simulate this by dropping the airplane nose low onto a set of platforms so that the main gear and nose gear impact the ground at the same time, but then the ground reaction load points aft, similar to what we see here when we combine the drag and ground reaction load. So we wanna make sure that this force vector has the same magnitude and direction as the combined reaction load here. 
We didn't invent this test method. It's based on legacy FAR Part 23 regulations. It's a proven method, but it does have its limitations. The main takeaway from this test is validation of the nose gear to firewall interface. We already proved out the subassembly of the nose gear through a test fixture, but what we haven't validated yet is the connection of the nose gear to the rest of the airframe. This test does a good job of stressing that connection pretty hard. Another thing I'll point out about this test, this occurs at the forwardmost CG position, so we're trying to get as much load as possible into the nose gear to prove that out. Because we're putting a lot of load into the nose gear, we're not stressing the main gear to the full extent required. To do that, we have to move on to our other phases of testing. So phase two, we're repeating the level landing with inclined reaction loads, but now we're keeping the nose clear of the ground to dump all that impact energy into the main gear. We still have a ground reaction force, that's the blue vector here. We still have a drag force on the main gear from tire spin-up, that's the red vector, and we can simulate those forces by combining them into an inclined reaction load, which we've shown in purple here, and then we do the same nose down drop test onto a series of platforms. Now our main gear platform is a little bit higher to keep the nose clear of the ground and drive all that impact energy into the main gear. So this is much more aggressive test on the main gear, it does a better job of proving it out. Uh, this is such an aggressive test that it's actually a little bit more aggressive than in real life because in a normal landing where you're coming in at a lower angle of attack like a level landing the nose gear starts to help out at some point so a long angle of attack on landing might be between zero and five or six degrees in that window the nose gear is going to help the main gear but for test purposes we can go uh, more aggressive to prove out the main gear this is the aft most pointing load vector on the main gear you can see that this force vector is pointed aft a little bit towards the tail that's for a level landing. If we land nose high or tail down, that will get this load vector to point forward. So we wanna prove out that the landing gear can handle this force through a range of angles because that's the reality of landing. And that's our phase three of testing here, tail down testing. In phase three of drop testing, we're simulating a nose high landing, basically coming in at a stall attitude or stalling the airplane onto the runway. And we wanna test out the landing gear at the most forward facing load vector on the landing gear. You can see our ground reaction load is sort of inclined towards the nose of the airplane compared to in phase two, our combined reaction load is pointed towards the tail. We're omitting drag load on the landing gear in phase three due to tire spin up. When would that occur? You can think about this two ways. You can imagine if we stalled the airplane on the runway and then bounced it and made a secondary impact. During that secondary impact, the tires are already spun up, which would minimize the drag load on the landing gear. The other way we can think about this is the drag load and the ground reaction load, they don't peak at the exact same time. When you hit the runway hard, the tires actually spin up to speed pretty quickly and that drag load decays by the time that the ground reaction load peaks. So depending on how we're modeling this impact event, you might see a low drag load either during a primary or a secondary impact on the landing gear. In phase two and phase three, we are testing the landing gear in an aft CG position, trying to impart the maximum amount of load into the main gear. The big difference between these two is we're exploring the extreme ends of the directions that the load vectors can point. What about somewhere in between the extremes? We tested that as well, sort of a phase 2.5 drop test where we were dropping the airplane at a pitch attitude, somewhere in between a level landing and a stall attitude to prove that out as well. Our test setup for phase three pretty much looks like the landing itself. We don't have to use platforms or anything like that to get our load vectors correct. You can see these pretty much look the same. You can start to see with the different types of landings that the airplane might encounter, we have to perform a range of different drops to validate the landing gear. We wouldn't expect the landing gear to be validated after just doing one big drop. We need to explore a bunch of different landing attitudes. Now that we've seen the theoretical background for the landing attitudes we are after, we know enough that we can look at the test rig itself. Let's check that out. The number of test specific pieces of hardware that we had to pull together for the drop test. I'll talk through them here. The first one that's probably most prominent right on the front of the aircraft is our engine mass simulator. We didn't want to drop the airplane with the engine attached in case something went wrong. We don't want to break the engine. It's a pretty expensive piece of hardware. So we replaced the mass of the engine with this. This is just uh, two cylinders. We cast out a quickcrete with threaded rod in them. Threaded rod bolts into this water jet cut steel plate that has the same bolt pattern on it as the engine has to interface with the engine mount. This is something that we weren't certain how it was gonna behave during drop testing. We don't have a lot of experience drop testing concrete. 
Concrete's pretty brittle, it could have just fallen apart, but it held together pretty nice throughout the whole drop test campaign. Working our way back from the firewall, we have our lifting frame here. This is made out of extruded T-slot aluminum with Dyneema cord. This is set up so we can pick the airplane up in a repeatable manner from specific locations that are strong enough to actually lift from. In front, we're lifting from the engine mount and firewall. And then back, we're lifting from the trunnion pins, which are where the main landing gear attached. That's a pretty solid piece of hardware that we can interface with and lift from. At the back of the frame, we have two turnbuckles. That allows us to adjust this rig to make sure that the airplane is level and roll. We want to drop it level so that both main landing gear impact the ground at the same time. And the turnbuckles allow us to do that. At the top of our lifting rig here, we have a ratcheting angle adjuster here that allows us to tilt the airplane nose high or nose low, depending on what test condition we're after. Working up from there, it's attached to an electric chain hoist that allows us to pick this whole assembly up and drop it. Pitch adjuster is attached to the chain hoist hook with a special knot. We have a little rip cord we pull and the knot comes undone and drops the airplane. I think that's everything I want to show on this side of the airplane. We'll come around this side to look at some more of the drop test hardware. You'll notice the wing is missing from the airplane. We took that off for the same reason that we took the engine off. We can't just forget about the wing though. We need to replace it structurally and that's what this little stub wing is for. This is uh, just an infused piece of carbon fiber that matches the geometry of the lower wing skin where it interfaces with the fuselage bottom. And that ties the fuselage together. If we had this removed, the fuselage skin is structural. It needs to have a load path across the belly so this accomplishes that goal. The weight of the wing is missing now because the stub wing is a lot smaller. We made up the missing wing weight with sandbags. These also are used to simulate the mass of people, cargo, and fuel. So we had these stacked up in the fuselage. It actually took quite a bit of sandbags to hit the target weight that we were after. So we had the forward baggage and aft baggage all stacked up with sandbags as well as most of the cabin was stacked up pretty high. We couldn't just stack the sandbags on the stub wing. We built this aluminum T-slot frame. We put a platform on top of this. This interfaces with the fuselage the exact same way that the wing does. So there's four bolts that the wing bolts into the fuselage with. There's lugs that transfer the load from the wing to the fuselage. This interfaces with those lugs the same way that the wing does. We built a platform on top of that and then stacked the sandbags on top of that and ratchet strap them down so they wouldn't move throughout the whole drop testing campaign. Not set up in this arrangement is our greased skid plates. We have a skid plate under each main landing gear tire so that when the landing gear contact the ground, they can splay out. That simulates basically what the wheels would do anyway. They can roll outward as the tires contact the ground. It also simulates if you had slippery wet pavement or ice that you were landing on. Allowing them to splay out basically imparts the maximum amount of bending moment into the structure and the gear struts. Also not shown in the setup is the platforms that we dropped the landing gear onto. So that was for the level landing with inclined reaction loads. Those are just built up with cinder blocks with a plywood platform on top with a two by four perimeter around them to keep the wheels from rolling off. Inside the fuselage, we had a number of sensors that we used to measure the acceleration or the G load during impact, as well as the drop height and the pitch and roll attitude of the aircraft. All that data we could send to a computer, we could record all that data throughout the drop test campaign and then later review it to understand if we were hitting our target G loads or if there's something that we didn't understand. Now that we've talked through the whole drop test setup and the test fixture, we know enough that we can go through some of the milestone drops that we completed and look at what we learned there. The first drop I want to show is drop 46, which is from phase one of our drop testing campaign. This was level landing with inclined reaction loads, and we ended up breaking the trailing link on the co-pilot side landing gear. So a root cause investigation of that found that there was a disconnect or an error between the initial design calculations, which showed how much shear area we needed in the part versus the actual CAD modeling and physical manufacturing of the part had less shear area than we needed. That led to a redesign of the trailing link, which had more shear area, and that unit passed on subsequent drop tests. We ended up redesigning the trailing links five times throughout the course of drop testing. Most of it was related to strengthening and stiffening the part, but some of the changes were related to changing the geometry of the trailing link to give different action during nose high drop tests. So we'll take a look at that too. 
We'll look at two drops side by side here. We have drop 103 on the left and drop 118 on the right. These aren't really milestone drops. They are lower drop heights, much less than the peak drop height. So I'm showing these to highlight the differences in trailing link action we were able to achieve through some iteration on the suspension geometry. In drop 103 on the left, you'll notice that the trailing link doesn't start to pivot and allow the shock to compress until the tire is nearly fully compressed. So the tire and shock act almost separately in stages and we get a bit of a peak in G-load in the middle of the impact event because they aren't working together. We made some adjustments to the geometry of the strut and trailing link and drop 118 on the right shows how these tweaks enable the change in the action of the trailing link so that it pivots sooner in the impact event and allows the shock and tire to work together in compression which reduces the G-load seen by the airframe. Interestingly, drop 118 on the right is run with 225 PSI of pressure in the shock which is much higher than drop 103 on the left at 150 PSI. So the geometry is really what makes the difference here. We didn't just dump the pressure out of the shocks. The delay in trailing link pivot action like we see on the left is partially related to this test method. I mentioned this earlier, but the drag load due to tire spin up and the ground reaction load don't peak at the same time. The drag load peaks first, followed by the peak and the impact load. What that means is during a true landing impact, the drag load from tire spin up would actually begin to kick the trail link back as the tire touches, which would better allow the tire and shock to compress together with the suspension geometry we have on the left in drop 103. Technically, there is an edge case where if you bounce the airplane and you have a secondary impact, the tires would already be spun up, which would minimize the drag load, and the real impact would better mimic what we have in our drop test shown here. So in that regard, you could argue the test method is still legitimate. So to ensure that the shock and tire are compressing together during a secondary impact, we modified the system geometry by extending the strut slightly. That's the black carbon end on the strut, and we also added a kink to the trailing link so that it wouldn't collide with the strut at higher deflection angles in the trailing link. I'll show another modification that came about in drop testing. This one is on the airframe. This is drop 118 again, but from a different angle. What I want to highlight is the diaphragm action going on in the fuselage side skin just behind the cabin. During the impact event, the fuselage essentially tries to bend. Think about bending a board over your knee. The fuselage is bending in the same way over the main gear, with the top of the fuselage in tension, the bottom in compression, and the sides in shear. The fuselage side skins are pretty thin, so in shear they can deform with these 45 degree ripples, which is specifically shear buckling. There are other aircraft you can point to that show shear buckling. Riveted aluminum airplanes have thin skins, so they can get the shear buckling during landing impacts too. We saw the same shear buckling modes to different degrees throughout the drop test campaign. This isn't much of an issue at the magnitude we show it here because the skins just spring back into their original shape. We didn't have a good engineering basis to add stiffening structure in the fuselage side skins in these areas because we predicted that our baseline laminate would be adequate and adding the stiffening structure would add weight and manufacturing time. Eventually, we did decide to add a foam core in the cabin and aft baggage area of the side skins to turn them into a sandwich structure. This stiffens them and adds extra margin in these areas to handle higher drops than what we've shown in this video. We do have other areas in the fuselage that have a foam core or sandwich structure to them, so adding this core in these areas just expands upon that approach. Drop 128 shows the same drop again after we stiffen the structure and you can see the shear buckling is no longer present. This change is something that will carry forward into production kits. This cycle that we've shown of testing and iterating is pretty common when you're trying to design highly optimized structures. There's a big emphasis that we have in the Dark Air One of keeping things lightweight. And what that means is that we need to strike the right balance with our safety margins in the structures. We need to build everything strong enough so that it's safe, of course, but we can't just overbuild everything because then it'd be overweight and that would negatively impact the performance and capability of the aircraft. So testing and iterating helps us achieve that correct balance in the design. One of the structures that I think we did a good job of striking that balance right out of the gate without too much iteration was on our landing gear struts. This is an assembly of a carbon fiber leg. It has metal ends and there's a number of bolted and bonded joints in the assembly. And on top of the basic design, there's also a modification we made where we cut off the end of the strut, molded a prepreg end, and then bonded that into the existing design. With all this, there's a lot to keep track of with the predicted stresses in the design, the safety margins, and the predicted failure modes. Both the original strut and the modification made it through testing without complaint and without failure. So we're pretty proud of how this performed in testing. There were a number of other tests that we performed on the landing gear. We did brake load testing, essentially simulating what do brake loads do to the landing gear. And we also conducted side load testing to simulate a crosswind landing where you impact the ground with a crab angle relative to the runway center line. Both the brake load testing and side load testing were conducted relatively quickly. By the time we got to those tests after conducting drop testing, we'd already done a lot of iteration refinement on the landing gear. So there wasn't too much left to tweak on the landing gear at that point. The landing gear are ready for flight testing, but we do still have a number of tests to conduct on the airframe. We're in the process of setting up 
uh, proof load test on the lugs that transfer loads from the wing to the fuselage. That's behind me, and we'll have videos coming out on that. If any of this looks interesting to you, whether it's the engineering, the manufacturing, or the testing, and this looks like something you'd want to get involved in, check out the careers page on deckyard.com. We're in the process of hiring both engineers and technicians to help us design and build aircraft with unique capabilities. That's all on the landing gear drop test campaign. Like I said, we're gonna have more videos coming out on further Dark R1 development work, so stay tuned for those. We'll catch you in the next video.